Just a warning to our listeners, today's episode contains graphic descriptions of extreme violence. I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we examine the defences Russia is building on its southern front, analyse partisan activity in Melitopol, and we look at the blurred lines between patriotism and war profiteering with spectator journalist Svetlana Moritz. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in faith. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Wednesday, the 12th of April. One year and 47 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our associate editor Dominic Nichols, assistant comment editor Francis Sternley, Brussels correspondent Joe Barnes, and our guest is Ukrainian journalist at The Spectator magazine, Svetlana Moronets. I started by asking Dom for the latest updates from Ukraine. Well, hi David and hi everybody, good to be back. So firstly, Joe's going to talk about it a little bit later, but Russian forces have been accused of war crimes after a couple of videos have emerged. Not entirely sure of the date. Some of the, the background information, i.e. the foliage of the uh, the surrounding trees and what have you, suggest it might be late, late last year, possibly summer last year, but videos of, of murders, basically. Russian forces uh, allegedly murdering and beheading Ukrainian soldiers. I mean, it, it is, it is uh, horrific. I've not watched it. I choose not to watch it. I don't need to watch it. I don't want to. I would suggest that nobody has to really, unless it's your professional, your professional calling, as in a war crimes investigator, of which there are probably very few listening. But uh, my very strong advice would be: listen to what the news says about it, what we say about it, but but do not watch it. You don't need to. It's not going to be helpful to you, and I don't think I don't think it'll be doing any favors whatsoever. But Joe will be talking more about that a little bit later. Elsewhere, it's worth noting today's defence intelligence report from the British MOD says that in recent weeks. Russia has continued to develop the linear defensive around the Zaporizhia area in southern Ukraine. So British MOD is saying that there's now three layers of defensive zones running for about 120 kilometres across Zaporizhia. So an interesting stat in, straight off the bat. I mean, that's quite, that's quite long, but you know, it's nothing like the whole length of the country, nothing like the length of the front line. So when we come to talk about defensive operations and, and how and where Ukrainian forces might try to break through in any this anticipated counteroffensive. I mean, that there are gaps in the line. You simply cannot hold a line the length of the, the front line in Ukraine at the moment. So Russia are, are concentrating their forces where they think the defence is, is most needed, where any counterattack may well most likely come. So they're, they're talking about Zaporizhia region. And at the moment, this looks like a forward line of combat positions and then two zones of nearly continuous but more elaborate, more in-depth defences, with each line being about 10 or 20 kilometres behind the one in front. Now, UK Defence Intelligence is saying Russia has put significant effort into these works in anticipation of a Ukrainian push towards Melitopol. We've talked about that before, this suggestion that if, if Ukraine were to surge down through Melitopol and hit the coast, then they, they split the Russian forces into two, basically, the the Donbass in the east and Crimea and the immediate region to the north of, of Crimea. So that seems to be where Russia are amassing their defensive forces. I think Joe is going to talk a little bit later about partisan activity in the Melitopol area, which again might be one of the reasons why Russia thinks this is the most likely area for any push. But what I would say is they're saying that the, the defences have the potential to be very formidable, but their utility almost entirely depends on them being supported by sufficient artillery and personnel. And they just finish off by saying it remains unclear if the southern grouping of forces, that's the Russian force in the fighting the war in that area, can currently muster these resources. So what I would say is that we've, we've seen defences before. We've seen dragon's teeth, these um, sort of metre high pyramid block, concrete block structures, which can be very effective. They can stop armoured vehicles, including tanks but we've seen them in the past just dumped in a very ad hoc fashion 
on soft ground, which is not good. It, they, they'll just get smushed into the into the mud by a, by a tank, unless the ground is particularly hard, which it, it could be over summer. But you know, you can't just put these things out and hope that they stop vehicles. They've got to be part of a much more considered defensive line. And also, as I've said before, all obstacles have to be covered if you're going to do it properly, have to be covered by observation and by fire. There's no point in putting obstacles out there and not keeping eyes on it and having weapons to do something about it if the if that's where the the other side choose to advance. I mean, that then just becomes a hindrance rather than an obstacle. And and the, in this case, the Ukrainians would have as much time as they like to, to get over, get around, get through those obstacles if they're not covered by, by um, observation and fire. So, it does come down to resources. Now, can Russia muster sufficient resources to cover this quite extensive 120-kilometer defensive belt? You know, time times three. If they're if they're saying there's th- three lines of them, that's a that's a pretty meaty obstacle if it's done properly. So, what would they hope to achieve here? I think so. Russia is going to pick the pit of ground that they think. Ukrainians are going to push through, which seems to be the Melitopol area from, down from Zaporizhia. But they would aim to halt, even if only temporarily, aim to halt any Ukrainian armoured advance on that initial obstacle belt, so stop them there, for those vehicles to then be attacked by Russian anti-tank guided missiles and other, and other weapons from the trenches positioned some way behind. I don't mean the 10 or 20 Ks behind, as the UK Defence Intelligence says the next big obstacle belt is, but you need troops dug in some way back to hit those vehicles that are snarled up on the uh, on the first line of defense ideally there'd be about a half or two-thirds of the way back along the sort of two-thirds or half of the the distance of the maximum range of their anti-tank guided missiles so they're not they're not immediately in the contact battle imagine ukrainian tank and armored personnel carriers snarled up on these dragon's teeth let's say they were positioned correctly you know you don't want those tanks to be able to use their co-actually mounted machine guns and the infantry carriers to be able to debus infantry to attack your forces if they're if they're within a couple of hundred meters so they should be some hundreds of meters back to be able to fire anti-tank guided missiles in relative in relative safety and and the priority for those russian defenders would be to hit the ukrainian engineering assets that are trying to punch through those obstacle belts or get out get over the ditches get through the minefields cross the rivers and then go after the infantry and the armor the, the tanks after that so all of this is very 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 considered but just positioning things like like dragon's teeth as we've seen willy-nilly that's not going to help the russians at all because if they are if they are within the line of sight or if they're in the line of sight of these of these anti-tank guided missiles then then they become a hindrance to themselves so you know you've got to really think about this and i'm not suggesting that that they have not thought about it but the 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 um the evidence we saw from last year was that that these Russian lines were not especially sophisticated. They've not they've not done a lot of the other military activities to any any real professionalism. So so are they able to to knit together a, a defensive line when their when their whole doctrine is talking about going forward and using massive firepower to go forward? They haven't really they're not really noted for for their hugely extensive and considered positioning of defensive assets. So this this will be. This would be a big test. And some of the lines that we saw last year, late last year, seemed c- constructed more by civilian engineers than military ones. And a military and civilian engineer, they would look at a piece of ground and a task, a defensive task, in very, very different ways. So, you know, I just want to reiterate, we don't know. I don't I don't know if, if Russia have put together a very firm defensive belt here, very considered, very well supported, mutually supporting. So, you know, there's overlapping arcs of fire and observation, all that kind of stuff. I'm not trying to put a rosy glow on this bit of news from from the UK Defence Intelligence. I'm not saying ignore it and Ukraine will be fine. Blah blah. blah. You know, that's not the case at all. This might be a very very formidable and permanent defensive line. I'm just saying we don't really know. And a putting putting a a proper defence in is a lot more considered than just digging some holes putting some obstacles in the way and and saying, go on then, you'll, ne- you'll never get through that. It's a lot more than that. And we won't really know unless and until it's tested in combat. And I just draw, just as a final thought here, just draw you back to, well, Ukraine know all this as well. And therefore, do they want to try and take on that that sort of extensive three three rows of 120 kilometres of defensive belt? Maybe they try and get over it with an airborne assault or around the sides or, or some other, or comes from a completely different, 
direction go go to a, from a different flank and come around behind them so there's there's ways of 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 putting in a proper defensive position and ways of countering it as well it, it is not as simple as just digging some holes and, and hoping for the best and conversely not as simple as just 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 running at it and, and shooting but we shall we shall see thanks Tom you've sketched out quite efficiently i think the kind of things the russian thought forces will be thinking of when they go on the defensive as, as we think is going to happen as we anticipate as you said the, the anticipated counteroffensive. could you could you turn can we turn the sort of camera angle around a little bit and talk a little bit about how the ukrainians will be thinking about this assuming you're not going to try and get around the side or or land behind if you are assaulting a position like this what what kind of tactics are you thinking of how are you thinking about doing that well you yeah, I mean, you'd put every effort into not meeting force with force. You know, if there's a great big fist there, you want to you want to avoid it, quite frankly. So you'd look for every reason to unhinge that enemy position by coming from a from a direction they weren't expecting, which ideally would be from behind them. If you can get if you can come around hundreds of kilometres to the north or south and and swing in that way, that would be that would be ideal. So you know, I mean, if there's a, a massive great obstacle belt that has been professionally laid covered with observation radars visual visual cues etc etc and fire you really don't want to be walking into that but it doesn't always go that way i mean look at look at um, saving private ryan look at d-day look at omaha beach i mean sometimes you've you've just got to go for it you've got to you've got to meet it and then it becomes very very difficult and very bloody but it all comes down to the combined arms nature of the operation you're putting together so just lobbing a load of infantry forward isn't going to work just doing it with tanks no just putting the engineering assets forward and saying once you're through lads give us a bell and we'll and we'll rustle up some tanks you know that's not going to work either it's all got to be together it's all got to be coordinated with a, a decent fire plan from the artillery and other other indirect fires such as mortars and so on and so forth it's got to be under a blanket of uh, let's say local air superiority so you own the skies for a for a very small period of time and geography but that blanket of air cover would, would give you some measure of confidence that you're not going to be molested too badly from free roaming in this case russian aircraft but uh, all of that needs to work together and it is e- exceptionally difficult to coordinate everything i mean down to the speed of the vehicles if the infantry carriers are not going at the same speed of the tanks or vice versa then uh, and that's not always the case then you have to you have to literally time your run in so you arrive at the contact point you arrive at the ob- the the, um, the objective at the same time you've got to take into account the the ranges of the main armament of the weapon systems you're using again so the tanks might be firing from a different place than the infantry carriers but do you want the infantry carriers to be left exposed on their own just because their their main armament might not fire as far i mean there's all these considerations and uh, and it you know, it doesn't come down to it doesn't come down to luck at all. It comes down to good planning. I'm not suggesting there is no room for luck, but it, you know you can't put anything to chance. But as we've seen now over a year of this thing, you know, a, a a mighty army with all the supposedly on paper with all the bells and whistles, you know that doesn't always cut the mustard when it comes up against a very determined enemy who knows what they're doing and is prepared to fight for the for the soil. So you know it has to all be together. As a, as a combined arms operation but there's a lot more going on as well and it might come down to the rates of ammunition fire of their defense missiles it might come down to what um, what would be happening in the sea at the time if, if 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 russia were able to then mess up this force by firing indirect fire from from maritime assets out in the sea of azov or in the in the black sea then maybe as a precursor operation you want you, ukraine would want to do something about that to to temporarily at least if not ideally permanently but temporarily have sea dominance so that so that russian can't do anything from the sea so all these different moving parts have to work together and of course it will never be perfect there will always be a little area that you're not you're not 100 percent happy with you just want a little bit more information or you just want a bit more time or you want a bit more force or you're not sure about something and it comes down to the the perfect is the enemy of the very good it's never going to be perfect and never going to have the perfect conditions to assault you're going to have to go with very good and that's where as i say you, your plan doesn't rely on luck but you do need a little a little bit of it because there's always going to be something that you've either not been able to attend to satisfactorily or there's some areas where you know you know you're light you might be for example you might have um a two, very few 
engineering assets. So prioritize their defense so they can get through the obstacle belt. But you know that is a is a particular area of concern, and you and therefore you might apportion your reserves to 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 um, to defend those engineering assets. So that denudes your reserves. It's always a way where you know at the start of the uh, at the start of the the, the operation you'd um, you might think it's going to go one way and and then as we always say the enemy gets a vote and suddenly you're into a, a, a quite a different a different battle but it does start with the building blocks of a combined arms operation thank you very much for that dom joe barnes can i come to you dom mentioned it at the beginning you've written up the story for the telegraph on these awful beheading videos that have come out of out of ukraine can you talk to us a little bit more about what you found when you were writing the story yeah hi folks um and i'll, I'll echo what Dom said at the beginning, I really recommend that people don't go hunting for these videos and try and watch them. They're, they're grisly, but I will do my best to kind of outline what we've seen and what I've seen in writing and researching for this piece. So we see two videos and then some pictures have emerged. Um, in the first video, it looks sort of more recent, but what we kind of see is what appear to be Wagner mercenaries. They are filming the corpses of two Ukrainian soldiers, possibly in back moot so it was shared on a um pro-russian telegram channel i won't go much further than that who are lying on the ground next to a military vehicle they have they're, they're de- de- decapitated and their hands are also appearing to have been cut off the russian voice that is heard in the background of this clip suggests that they were killed by a mine their armored vehicle they were in detonated as a result of that mine and it appears that then then they this voice says they killed them someone came up to them they are up to them and then cut their heads off and then the second video and this is um sort of also introduced uh and kind of a, a nod to the open source intelligence community and what we've learned from them throughout the war, because you can kind of conclude from it that it likely wasn't filmed recently. There's um, uh, it's a video of a squirming Ukrainian soldier being pinned down by a Russian with a knife, but around them is lots of green foliage, which would suggest that it was probably actually filmed in 2022 as the summer was there when you see this sort of foliage around the battlefield of Ukraine. Um, but yeah, what we what we know is the second clip, it shows this Ukrainian soldier. He's identified by the traditional yellow tactical armband that the Ukrainian soldiers wear. And he is struggling and screaming on the floor as he's pinned down. The Russian proceeds to take what looks like a crude sort of standard battle knife, likely not sharp enough to sufficiently behead someone, and proceeds to stab him in the neck while taking his head off. A, another Russian in the background holds up the Ukrainian's tactical vest, basically to show that he is a member of Ukraine's armed forces. It displays the the Velcro patch that they that they so often wear on their body armor on their uniforms while in battle. You hear a few Russian voices, and I won't use the kind of swear words in this, but it's "Get working, brothers! Break his spine! Have you never never cut off a head before?" And at the end of the clip. There are cheers as the Ukrainian's decapitated head is held aloft towards the camera. So it's, this is this is sort of truly, truly grisly footage, and yeah, it's real, real nightmarish stuff. And yeah, we honestly, we yeah, it's not it's not something to be to be hunting out or be watching. Why is it being done? We don't know. Wagner have a tradition of brutal tactics used against their own. We've seen apparent videos of them using sledgehammers to kill Russians that have tried to desert Wagner forces. And then if we go back to, I think it's 2017, members of the Wagner force who were fighting in Syria at the time were seen beating a Syrian prisoner who was believed to have been a deserter from the Syrian army with a sledgehammer. And then they beheaded and amputated his arm with a sapper's trail. So this isn't this isn't something alien to Wagner. They've done this before, and I would likely suggest that this is Wagner conducting this sort of terrifying, horrific executions um, and beheadings of Ukrainian servicemen. Then there's some other footage as well, which appeared to show a head on a spike, a decapitated head on a spike. The Institute of the Study of War 
uh, the US-based think tank, said that this was likely a Ukrainian serviceman killed in Bakhmut. And we know that Wagner have been spearheading Russia's attempt to take Bakhmut, the eastern city in the Donetsk region, for a long time now. And then what has been the reaction in Ukraine? Vladimir Zelensky, the president on Wednesday, he said um, this is something the world cannot ignore, how easily these beasts kill. And then he goes on to use the harrowing footage basically to rally Western leaders for extra support. And he, he said, and I quote President Zelensky, no one will understand if leaders don't react. Action is required now. We in Ukraine must focus on the front lines as much as possible. So he's essentially using this as saying, look, we need your support and more than ever, basically to expel Russia from our country. And it's, it's, it's a well-known tactic from the Ukrainian government machine that they use atrocities like this. They use them massively efficiently in Butch, Butcher. And we saw horrific scenes of executed civilians. Those pictures were shown to world leaders when Zelensky was asking for weapons and that kind of ended with extra help being offered by the West. Andre Yermak, his chief of staff, he said there will be accountability for everything. So this is um, Ukraine's push to basically put, prosecute war crimes in Ukraine. They will use this as evidence that Russia has been con basically con committing war crimes. And then um, a little bit on from Ukraine's military intelligence, they described the video as a deliberate act of psychological warfare against Ukraine. And they said the goal of this video, amongst other things, is to demoralise the Ukrainian armed forces and sow panic. And he said those, so a spokesman for the Ukrainian's military intelligence said those displayed atrocities aim to cow their own soldiers as well. As in, don't you think about surrendering? They will do the same to you in Ukrainian captivity as we do to Ukrainian prisoners of war. So they're basically using this as a sort of warning the Ukrainian military intelligence say to suggest that Ukraine would also do this to a captured Russian. It's evidence that we haven't seen so far and we'd like to think the Ukrainians definitely are doing this because they are trying to adhere to things like the Geneva Convention and the rights afforded to prisoners of war. Thank you very much for that, Jojo. Can I stay with you just for another story you've been working on? You've been looking at the activities of Ukrainian partisans in Melitopol ahead of as we've discussed, uh, an expected counteroffensive by Kyiv. Can you talk to us about what you found there? Yeah, so I, I, I spoke to a chap called Ivan, not his real name, and he is one of the leaders of the Yellow Ribbon Movement, which is a, a non-violent resistance movement. Uh, you can call them partisans because they're staunchly pro-Ukrainian. And they their main aim is to sort of boost morale inside occupied territories, they go around, they paint yellow ribbons, they hang yellow ribbons and then seek to push them out, share them via social media to basically raise awareness. And they're, they're often their message in Kherson. They would they would graffiti that Kherson is Ukraine, um, Militia Pol, similar graffiti. But also they have a, a more interesting side to them. And one of the interesting things, as Don was alluding to, the UK Defence Intelligence update, they are looking very closely at potentially being the target for a Ukrainian counteroffensive. And Ivan told me that people were very much looking forward to that moment. And actually, the the news of this future counteroffensive and the potential that Militiopol and the Zaporizhia region could be targeted by Ukraine has encouraged a, a, a lot of people to do something patriotic. So it's actually more people are joining and he described it as we've seen a big boom in pro-Ukrainians feeling more and more confident to join their resistance movement. And so from my trips to Kherson and from our other reporters who have reported out of that city after its liberation, people essentially went into their shells. They they refused to come out and amid fears that they would be kind of arrested by Russians, tortured by Russians, uh, interrogated violently by Russians. So these this yellow movement, the yellow ribbon movement, sorry, are going out and basically showing that these cities are Ukrainian, there's still a Ukrainian underbelly to them, despite them having been occupied by Russia for many months. But what, what actually is interesting, um, Ivan explained to me, I asked, because he is based in Militia Pole, and I asked him about what is the current situation like? Um, and he said, look, at the moment, it's only really officer staff based in the city of Militia Pole. And he said, the Russians are using saunas to hang out and take a shower. And he said that Ukrainians are taking photos of this and sending them to 
sending them to the armed forces. And he said, meanwhile, Russia has dispatched sectist fighters from the Donetsk People's Republic, the Luhansk People's Republic, these pro Kremlin breakaway areas in Ukraine. Chechens and conscripts that are often used as cannon fodder by Moscow, they have been the ones sent to the southern front line. So it's likely, from what I've heard from Ivan, that the defences that the UK intelligence update is talking about is being manned by sort of these crudely trained, illly trained fighters and not Russia's sort of top troops. But we, I can't say that for certain. But yeah, so these, um, but back to sort of the yellow ribbon movement, they're a non-violent movement. Um, so they're basically being re- responsible for plastering pictures of pro-Kremlin collaborators over the streets to basically out these collaborators and let people know. More recently, they have been defacing Russian ruble banknotes that have been rolled out across occupied areas of Ukraine with pro-Ukrainian slogans such as Militia Polish Ukraine and with the famous yellow ribbon that has become their sign. But they've also, um, information they've gathered over the months of occupation has been used by local partisan movements and Ukraine's armed forces. Um, One quite funny story Ivan told me was when Chechen fighters were stationed in Militia Pole, the building they were were staying in was targeted by patriotic Ukrainian graffiti. And these Chechens soon got wind of that and amid fears that partisans or the armed uh, Ukrainian armed forces, special forces, may be operating deep behind enemy lines, would learn about their presence there. They soon fled and took up buildings elsewhere. So it's the Yellow Ribbon Project is mainly to boost morale of Ukrainians, but it also has a demoralising impact on Russians there. They've also been investigating war crimes. They've compiled detailed dossiers on the deportation of orphans and children from Militia Pola. It's a crime that Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, has been charged with by the International Criminal Court. But then what I'd, what I'd say is it's actually, um, it helps us understand sort of the atmosphere and the the potential that this is the direction the counteroffensive is going. They're, they're already preparing their new posters. They've uh, developed a Militia Pole is Ukraine poster and they're starting to um, put out. They've got a secret network of printers that can print 200 of these posters a night uh, in Militia Pole. And then they'll, they're plastered around the city while Russian occupiers are sleeping. So they're, 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 they're really sort of sowing the seeds of let's boost morale, let's get people on board ahead of what could be a potential counter-offensive in that direction, but also then terrifying their Russian occupiers at the same time. It's a it's a, a fascinating sort of psychological battle they're having while not while they're not the partisans we hear so much about who do detonate car bombs to target like kind of Russian installed officials or blow up logistics hubs. So it's, it's a different angle on the partisan that's quite interesting and I recommend you uh, give the full piece a read because my sort of breakdown of it won't do it justice and Ivan to say not his real name for security reasons is a fascinating chap and what he says is very interesting so I'll stop that thank you very much for that Joe Francis can I come to you just for some quick diplomatic updates before we come to Svetlana Francis Turnley Thanks, David. Dom and Joe have already covered the hideous story of apparent beheadings of Ukrainian soldiers. I'll only add to that that it has unsurprisingly led to considerable discussion this morning amongst commentators and politicians and senior diplomatic figures. I think the worst thing, though, is that we have, as Joe was saying, come to expect such things. It's already, I think, an indicator of the shifting moral landscape that this war has triggered brutality that would have been considered inconceivable, beheadings in war on European soil, as, is no longer as shocking as it was. This is why, of course, President Zelensky is trying to frame this as yet another example of what is at stake in Ukraine, whether we want to live in a world where such behavior is an accepted feature of modern warfare, as it was for the majority of human history or not. It is that serious. But turning to the diplomatic sphere directly, the other big story 
this morning is some interesting analysis from the director of the CIA. Now, he said that Russia risks becoming an economic colony of China as its isolation from the West deepens following the invasion of Ukraine. William Burns was speaking at an event at Rice University in Texas, and he said, Russia is becoming more and more dependent on China and, in some respects, runs the risk of becoming an economic colony of the country over time, dependent for export of energy resources and raw materials. Now, we've covered this theme for some time now, but I think it's interesting given the source of this, what's coming from, and it underlines, I think, an uncomfortable truth that as things stand, China benefits whether Russia wins or loses in Ukraine, which explains largely, I think, its ambiguity on the issue. It arguably could have been otherwise had there been starker consequences earlier on for countries that maintained stronger relations with Moscow. But as it currently stands, it seeks to and will arguably benefit from Russian dependency, whatever happens on the ground. If Russia succeeds, one of its allies will have delivered a sizable blow to the West, justifying the idea that imperial ambitions can be successfully carried out and also have bolstered its economy and given it another source of income when whether there may one day be future sanctions over Taiwan, for example. But if Russia fails, it's acquired a dependency, this being China, right on Europe's doorstep. So it's in a very strong position. And there is an irony here, I think, which is one of the greatest victims of historic Russian imperialism was China itself in the 19th century. One of the worst of the so-called unequal treaties was Aijin in 1858 and Peking in 1860, in which China lost Manchuria and access to the Sea of Japan to Russia. Now, these treaties were also very punitive on ethnic Chinese who lived in certain areas and they were late, they were sort of pushed out and later colonized by ethnic Russians. Then you go on into the Stalinist era and the interwar ethnic persecutions there. So we're in a situation where the old empire faces becoming a colony of the new. And I think this should be a far bigger concern in Moscow than it seems to be. China is already having a destabilizing influence in certain regions and is seeking to play a role in the Russian sphere of influence in Central Asia. Asia, something, of course, which James has covered extensively on the podcast. She is calling a meeting of Central Asia, former Soviet bloc countries in a summit in May, which clearly is indicative of the shifting sands of geopolitics at the moment. But as I say, I would posit that in a contest between a dragon and a bear, my money is on the dragon. And I think that we are seeing a, a sizable development here and one that clearly, if the CIA director is discussing it in the length that he has, is of particular attention to the US, US and might explain some of the hesitancy of the West more broadly in how it's conducted itself over the war in Ukraine, given the fears that the country that will benefit most is the emerging threat of China. And of course, that's another thing that we've touched on a lot on the podcast in the past. So uh, there are other diplomatic updates, David, but um, let's come to those later. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Francis. Svetlana Moronets, it's really wonderful to see you again and welcome you back to The Telegraph. Thank you so much for coming in. You've written Two really fascinating things for The Spectator magazine. I would recommend all listeners to go and read them there as well. But we wanted to hear your thoughts on them as well. Can we start with your article? It's titled The Blurred Lines Between Patriotism and Profiteering in Ukraine. Um, What do you argue in this article and why did you decide to write it? Hi, David. Thank you for having me again. How to start? In Ukraine, the patriotism is like the most important thing that helped Ukrainian to stood up against Russian army in the first weeks of the full-scale invasion. But with the time, I noticed, and many people in Ukraine noticed, that some businesses in Ukraine are trying to profit from the war. And patriotic branding has always been popular in Ukraine when selling traditional clothes, art, post stamps, music. But since February last year, the whole country has started working together to equip the army and businesses began to donate to the army, despite the economic crisis caused by the war. Some got, got bankrupt. That's why Ukrainians began to buy from local sellers, especially those promising to share the profits with the army. It was a win-win to support uh, the economy and the soldiers, but it was exactly that moment when some of the big businesses realized that everything with the military logo sells. So, yes, you could buy like T-shirts with Ukrainian flag, the bracelets with the Ukrainian flag or the 
trident, but also worse symbols have been slapped on socks, flip-flops, vodka labels, designer clothes, sweets, and even sex shops. And many Ukrainians see it as excessive and soldiers see it like it devalues what they are going through and if it offends them. And for example, uh, you can buy heroic bucha kombucha with citrus flavor. And, and as, everyone, as everyone probably remembers in bucha were found, found massacred, th- hundreds of massacred bodies. And how appropriate is to use that on a beer or, for example, Azov-style radish seeds and Ukrainian ranch onion bulbs. And there are also Heroes Don't Die beer and coffee cups bearing the face of an assassinated Ukrainian soldier. So the question here is, are those businesses really feel so patriotic that they try to commemorate all these things that happened during the uh, large-scale war, war with Russia? Or they just see that Ukrainians are keen to buy these products to support the army and because they feel so patriotic and they just make money of it. And that was why I wrote this piece. To what extent, Svetlana, do you think that it's, it's a, a kind of a mix of both of those things? I mean, that's why my impression from your article you know the headline the blurred lines i, I find that very interesting i mean wh- where where do you stand on this do you go back and and look at it in different ways i mean w- was it surprising to you when you were back in ukraine and you saw this i think that uh many ukrainians that they don't realize that some businesses just try to profit. And for example, you go on the street in Lviv and you see the donuts painted in blue and yellow colors and you want to buy those donuts because you feel an emo- emotional connection to these colors. And you feel that even then they say that they will send part of the money to the army. Anyway, you feel that you want you are supporting your country in this way because you are buying from the local business. And also many, many businesses are really genuinely believing that there is not, nothing wrong with such labels, that nothing wrong uh, that with using war themes in advertisement because they already donated uh, millions of pounds into Ukrainian budget and to the military. So... There should be a regulation, but the question and Ukrainian MPs, they submitted a draft law which would control commercial advertising and marketing using wartime themes. And if true, if it passes through Ukrainian parliament, then all the war related branding, including the ref- references to massacres, hostilities, names of weapons, including like slogans like glory to Ukraine will be banned for abusing in advertising. But also there is another side to, to this. If all of this is banned, will it affect the profits of Ukrainian companies and will they be able to help to the army after that? So, uh, in my point of view, that the possible compromise could be that there should be like a system of licensing the companies who wish to use patriotic slogans. So there would be like a commission saying, okay, this slogan is too excessive or this slogan is okay. For example, there was a, a slogan, make a laser hair removal to straighten, to straighten the, the, the army. And... For me, it sounds horrible, and I understand why soldiers feel so offended. But if that system works, or if if it to be created, will the government have time to do that? Because as we know, the counteroffensive is coming, it is the war time, and to control the advertisement is not like the most think that should be a priority right now. And I also think that also even if such advertising will be banned, it won't stop anyway, because to implement the fees, all this stuff, it takes time to write the law, to correct the law. And also, I don't think that Ukrainian U- Ukrainians will stop buying that. Before we move on, can I ask you, Svetlana, when you were back in January, did the amount of things like this, did it surprise you? I mean, obviously, you knew this was going on. You can see social media, you can talk to people. But when you were there, did it surprise you in just the, the volume of things that, that you saw and, and, the, and, the, and the type? I don't think so, because 
patriotic branding is very common in Ukraine, especially since 2014, because it was like the way to keep the spirit high. And also when I was in Viv, I bought a bracelet with blue and yellow colors myself. And I bought it from an older woman who was knitting those bracelets and selling them just to survive during the war because of the crisis, because of the inflation, because the salaries, the pensions are so low. And it, it didn't surprise me. It's just I, I couldn't understand like some of the banners they said, for example, we returned her son, now returned the pleasant smell. I mean, uh, those people who make such advertising, don't they understand how bad it is, those marketologists? Maybe they just, uh, just fire them and hire a better ones. <laughs> Maybe that, 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 that could be a way out. I think it's, it's it just... I think most of them just f feel that they want to do something for the country, but they don't understand what is like too much. <laughs> Where is that borderline? And I think if the regulation will be implemented, it will be so difficult to find that borderline. Can Ukrainian flag be used on a T-shirt or not? Is it already too much or not? Should it be banned or not? Because I don't know the answer to that, because I think that, for example, Ukrainian flag or the world's glory to Ukraine became already like they advertise Ukraine abroad and they make people remember about Ukraine. And uh, even here in Britain, you walk and you see in the streets Ukrainian flags everywhere, everywhere. And I saw uh, T-shirts and bracelets too being sold. Should it be banned? I, did, I don't think so. So I, it, it's very difficult to find that line when have to have to control it. <laughs> Thank you, Svetlana. Dom, I think you had a question. Yeah, hi, Svetlana. Thanks so much for coming back. Always, uh, it's great to see you. Just a question on on this this side of of the of the house. What you've been describing there is it could be characterised as sort of low low level grifting, trying to make a buck or two, a revenue or two. I mean, any sign that there's any, anything more organised and and large scale in terms of trying to milk the system from your from your recent time out there? Thanks. No, I have not seen any reports about that. It's mostly it's mostly just Ukrainian businesses who are trying to who are selling those the stuff. So no, no, I I didn't see any scam about the topic. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Joe Barnes, very quickly. Thank you. Hi, Svetlana. Uh, nice to have you on again. Mine's a similar question to Dom's, and I was so when when you were in. In Ukraine, a lot of the market stalls around, so in Independence Square, Maidan Square in Kiev, or when you're out on the street somewhere else, sell things like Ukrainian military patches, or the Velcro patches that we see so often on the Ukrainian Armed Forces uniforms and, and stuff like that. I'm just wondering, do you think these this new attempt to crack down on businesses will have a sort of an, an effect, an impact on kind of small traders who really do rely on on kind of things like this to make money because it's it's is normally old ladies or kind of young kids selling this sort of merchandise oft, often to <laughs> western journalists or or people of of that ilk coming in to report on the conflict in ukraine Thank you for your question. Yes, I think uh, for sure this will be the first people who will suffer because of those restrictions. Because if businesses, big businesses can continue without patriotic advertisement, they can anyway sell their products. But those older ladies or men selling all these bracelets or souvenirs, it is how they make money, it's their main income, and what are they going to do after that? So I think there should be, the government should, buy, should ban using the names of the like, massacres, hostilities, like uh, cities where a lot of people died, like Bucha or Mariupol, uh, using it in a context since 2022 invasion. But I think the rest, like the flags, souvenirs, all, all of this should stay. And 
For example, when I buy such things, I have a T-shirt saying I am Ukrainian and it makes me feel better. And I think it makes feel better a lot of Ukrainians. And th th that's why it shouldn't be banned completely. And also, you know, I don't know when a Ukrainian government will have time to check that law, the draft law that has been submitted. Because, for example, Ukraine's law already forbids using or imitating the trident or and the state flag in advertising. But nobody seems to care about it. And since uh, the full-scale invasion, we saw Ukrainian flag, flag everywhere in every advertising. So even if the new restrictions are to be implemented, the patriotic branding is unlikely to end. And also how they are going to control these uh, local sellers, small small businesses that are in the tents in Kiev or in Viv selling those souvenirs. Are, is the police going to raid them and just shut them down or how it's going to work? Well, thank you, Joe and Dom, for your questions. Svetlana, can we move on to a, a different topic you've been writing about earlier on when describing the Russian defensive efforts, Dom Nichols made one point that really the upcoming anticipated counteroffensive will be a battle of resources. And one of those resources for both sides is fighting men. We've touched a few times on the issues of conscription for the Russian side in this, but you've been writing about some of the issues Ukraine has faced when it comes to conscription, finding fighting men for the armed forces. When you were looking into this, what did you find? Uh, so today, Ukrainian army has more than a million soldiers, but it is not not enough because the Ukraine is very big country. We are bordered in Belarus, Belarus, Russia, and Transnistria, and part of Ukrainian uh, troops have constantly to stay, for example, in the border with, with Transnistria, fearing the upcoming offensive. And also Kiev needs more men to replace those who died, who are wounded or need a rotation. And usually the, consc the, the conscription was going on since last February. And usually the representatives of the mili military commissariats would go to your home and hand out the summon. And you would need to go to the conscription center to update the register and to have a medical commission and then you will be sent for a training. But since half a year ago, people were seen handing out summons in like shopping centers, in parks, chasing men on the streets and ever even seen handing out summonses from the ambulances. And there was a video from Odessa where the man was forcibly drugged into the conscription center. So for sure it worries many Ukrainians and many of them fear that if they will be conscripted, they will be sent to the war immediately without basic training because Ukrainian troops need at least from 30 to 70 days of basic training. But sometimes soldiers don't receive even that because the war is going on every day and Ukraine needs more and more men. And for sure, there is a hotline for soldiers and they can call there and complain about that they were sent to uh, to the war and they didn't d don't know how to shoot from the gun, for example. But I don't know if it really worked so far. And this week, the new c correction to the law allowed to distribute summons everywhere. And if in 2014, when Russia invaded, the regular mi military personnel had to rely mostly on patriots who felt it was their duty to resist occupying forces. But right now, yes, even if many volunt thousands volunteered to the army, but anyway, many were also trying to flee because, I mean, Nobody was born to fight a war and it's understandable that many men fear fear that fe fear to be conscripted. And that, that was the reason why Zelensky restricted for male Ukrainian aged between 18 and 60 to leave the country. And the border will be shut till the Martial law ends. And because of this, uh, some men seek illegal ways to flee the country or they buy the fake documents uh, that say that they have disabilities 
or that they have three more children because it is one of the reasons why you can be like stay safe and not be const- conscripted. It is very risky because trying to flee or faking the documents, avoiding the conscription is punishable by imprisonment for f- from two to five years. So it's a big term, but there are many right now Telegram channels in Ukraine who offer fake documents for sale. The Ministry of Defense is trying to ban it, to ban them, but it's impossible just to follow and to find and to ban all of these channels. And the price there varies, like if to talk in pounds from 1,000 to 10,000 pounds, and it is a huge price for an average Ukrainian where the average salary is like 335 pounds. So only people with bigger income can afford these fake documents. And the cheaper options is when they uh, get dressed as women and they go and sit on boats and try to cross the river to Romania on ha- or hike through the mountains. And this winter, uh, some of them were found freezed to death. So, but more, there are more expensive options like to use the system Schlag, it translates like path in English, and it, it allows volunteers and drivers to leave the country if they are transporting humanitarian aid or medical cargo and they can stay abroad up to 30 days. So, some men who receive those fake documents that they are volunteers or the drivers. Uh, they go abroad and never return. And there was a report recently showing that 11% of all those men that went abroad as volunteers never returned. Thank you, Svetlana. Just two questions from me before we start to wrap up. One is, do we have a sense, or do you have a sense of just how many people we are talking about? Is this a particularly big problem or does it only affect, is it a couple of thousand people? How, how many people really in, in real terms are we talking about here? And secondly, when when thinking about this topic and talking to your your contacts in Ukraine, I mean, what, what do they tell you? What is the feeling about being called up for, for the army? What do you hear from your contacts out, out in the country at the moment? Thanks. About the numbers, if we don't know the clear number of all the people who fled, but if to talk about those who faked their documents as volunteers and crossed the country through the system Schlag, these are were, these were almost 10,000 people. So it's quite a big number and the government ha- has not found a way still how to stop this, 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 this to stop this system to be used for fleeing the country, and if to talk about people that I know of in Ukraine and my friends and to whom I talk, there are still many volunteers. And Ukrainian Defense Ministry recently announced that they are creating a new u- unit who will participate in the upcoming offensive, and like more than 25,000 people volunteered to that unit. And I think it is a great number as we are like more than one year fighting a full-scale war and still there are so many people volunteering. But I know that many like say that they don't know how to fight, but they know how to earn money. So they donate money to the army. And but they know that they eventually their time will come. And of course, they are scared and they are just waiting because they are not ready to volunteer. But they don't want to flee either because they feel that to fight and protect their country is their responsibility for 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 their homeland. So if they will be called up, they will go and fight. Thank you, Svetlana. Francis, can I come to you? We're just starting to come to the end of our time together today. So, Francis, can I come to you for some final diplomatic updates and then we'll go to our final thoughts? Thanks, David. Just a couple from me. We understand this morning, and this has been reported in Politico, that Iran is in secret talks with China in an attempt to replenish their supply of a key chemical compound used to propel ballistic missiles. Now, this is according to diplomats who are very familiar with the matter. If true, and this is the real significance of this, it would mark a clear violation of the United Nations sanctions and possibly help Moscow replenish its depleted stock of rockets. Tehran has held concurrent negotiations with officials and government-backed entities 
facilities from both countries, including the state-owned Russian chemical maker FKP, to acquire large amounts of AP, which is the main ingredient in solid propellants used to power these missiles. And this is all coming from the diplomats who've requested anonymity in order to discuss confidential information. Now, it comes as no great shock given the Iranian drone saga, but this is yet another alarming sign, I think, that the West's enemies are choosing to work more closely together. And we lose sight of what's happening in the Middle East at our peril, I think. If Iran were suddenly on the precipice of acquiring a nuclear weapon, for instance, Israel is unlikely to permit that, and we would face strikes and possibly war in that region. So it is very important to be sensitive to this, as well as marking when we see countries that are, of course, hostile to the West, becoming more brazen in their attempts to uh, to be working cooperatively with each other. Just the other update I wanted to touch on is Poland have said that they plan to have Europe's strongest army in the next two years. That's coming from the country's defence minister. They've said that spurred on by the threat of Russian aggression, the Polish government wants to embark on this massive multi-billion pound defence spending spree, which sees huge orders for tanks, artillery, combat aircraft, of course, expanding the Polish army to 300 per thousand personnel and they are clearly seeking to go even further and the way that they're positing this is that it's in the context of the uh, election that's happening at the moment they were requesting we need two more years and then the polish army will be the strongest in europe we're on track to do this they've got a general election in autumn and so I think it's important to understand this in the political context, uh, both domestically, but of course the other significance of this is internationally and the amount of plaudits, which I alluded to yesterday, that Poland has received as a consequence of its new role and it's willing to leverage its military power for what it is in a way that arguably is more effective than some other countries in Europe. So uh, a noteworthy story, I think, just again, Poland really urging Uh, the rest of Europe to sort of keep up with it in a sense and and also the timing being interesting given the fact that the Polish Prime Minister is currently in the United States and is expected to propose a a new strategic partnership with Washington in an attempt to underscore the strong relations between the two countries. So a noteworthy development I think but I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much Francis. Well we're coming to our final thoughts. So Dom Nichols would you like to go first? What will you be looking at in the days to come? Well, um, in the days to come, I'm just getting re- getting back into the brief. But as a final thought, I would just mark uh, President Joe Biden, who's in Belfast today, start of a tour of, of Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And he's just finished his speech at Queen's University there. Uh, he talked mostly about uh, about the Good Friday Agreement, 25th anniversary this week, obviously. Good Friday Agreement and investment. Didn't make any mention at all of Ukraine. Not necessarily surprising that um and obviously no mention of the leaks the intelligence leaks but yeah so he's literally just finished speaking and um and was talking more about the the investment opportunities that's a, that are open to northern ireland from the us if um if they could get uh, the power sharing deal to to work over there thank you dom uh joe barnes all right yeah um, so I'm, I'm going to go back to these kind of horrific videos where i saw the content were on pro kremlin outlets and they pinpointed them towards Wagner and we know there's a struggle between the the Kremlin Wagner and the Russian Defence Ministry. It's well publicised. We've written lots on it. Lots of foreign policy and analysts looking at the war in Ukraine speak on it. So I'm, it's, and it is pure speculation on my part but just kind of a bit of sort of new analysis. Is it, is it potentially these videos were floated and leaked at this moment in time to discredit Wagner's efforts in the war at a time when Bakhmut could fall and Wagner would seek to basically seize on that as a political victory and its its leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, would use that to bolster his own standing in Moscow and Russia. So it's just a question, is this a sort of a, an information warfare and, and part of the ongoing feud within Kind of Russian military circles between Wagner and the more standard land forces and potentially one of the more conventional land forces is allies attempting to discredit and kind of make paint Wagner in a worse light than they're already painted in across the world but also within Russia because I'm sure Russians seeing many normal Russians seeing this will also be equally horrified by what we have seen and yeah thank you for listening folks. 
Thank you, Joe. Francis Sterling. Thanks, David. I'm very grateful to a listener for pointing me to a piece by Peter Dickinson of the Atlantic Council, who's written reflecting on Finland joining NATO and the relatively minimal Russian reaction to this. And I'll read a couple of quotes in full because I think he makes some excellent points. If Putin genuinely felt NATO posed a security threat to Russia, he could have attempted to derail Finland's membership bid via a combination of diplomatic and military pressure. At the very least, he could have dramatically increased the Russian army presence in the region. Instead, he did next to nothing. And he goes on. This should provide critics of NATO enlargement with food for thought. Opponents have long accused the alliance of provoking Russia by welcoming countries from the former Eastern Bloc. But it is now painfully apparent that the decision to keep Ukraine internationally isolated was actually far more provocative in practice. Indeed, the security guarantees that come with NATO membership are probably the only reason why we are not currently confronted by an even larger war and further Russian invasions. Unless Ukraine can secure similar security guarantees, a lasting peace in Eastern Europe will likely remain elusive. And he's right. Russia sought to justify the war in Ukraine as being a result of NATO encroachment, NATO expansionism, and yet... There is no similar accusations that are being accused around Finland joining. And I think it reveals just the extent to which this is a war that is actually being conducted due to Russia's own imperialist ambitions, and particularly Putin's. We drew attention at the time, of course, to the remarks by Putin in June last year when he compared himself to Peter the Great. And and it seemed to us then that this really fundamentally changed the justifications for this war and and as I say the masks seem to have have slipped but sadly that point doesn't seem to have been accepted or picked up by everybody in the commentariat who still try to explain this war as a rational action as opposed to an ideologically motivated one designed in part to maintain some semblance of the former Russian empire. And so I think this is a really important point and one that, that really needs to be drummed home very strongly that we were speculating for months really about what Russia's motivations were, what Putin's true ideology was. And yet I think we've started to see that as the war has gone on, it's become more evident what the reality is but also I think it's become a particularly virulent and aggressive form of what we saw before even more so than perhaps it was originally conceived the the deranged statements by President Medvedev uh, are are just well particularly striking I think and it suggests that the elite if they were ever perhaps detached and Machiavellian and sort of saw their propaganda for what it was namely nonsense there's evidence now they're starting to believe it and Whilst this may be positive in some ways, it means that they're more likely perhaps to make mistakes. It can also be dangerous, especially as we approach some sort of endgame in the future. So I think it's certainly important that we continue to monitor the domestic scene in Russia very, very closely indeed. Because I think it's revealing as to the direction of travel that this war may be going. And the violence we've described today, I think, is indicative of that. But also what the reaction may well be from Russia as certain other things happen in the coming weeks and months. And so if it was ever important before, it's doubly important so now. Well, thank you, Dom, Joe and Francis. Uh, Svetlana, as our guest, would you like to have the very final words? Uh, I would like also to add about uh, what's going on with the Russian patriarchal churches in Ukraine. Uh, Currently, uh, the Moscow... Moscow Patriarchate priests are being expelled not only from Kiev Pechersk Lavra, but also uh, their churches have been uh, banned from operating already in three or four regions of Ukraine. And it's happened after um, a priest in Khmelnytsky region assaulted a Ukrainian soldiers. And also there were a lot of cases when priests of Moscow Patriarchate were refusing uh, to uh, have a, a mass uh, for a fall de- for a fallen soldier, they were refusing to pray for them after they died, and they were blocking the church and not allowing the the parents of the soldiers and his coffin with him to to get inside. So after all of these uh, scandals, a uh, lot of regions in Ukraine are banning those churches and uh, all those buildings will go uh, will later belong to the Orthodox Church of Ukraine so uh, it's it's still uh, difficult to get uh, to understand how it's going to happen how those all those priests are going to leave those churches and when it's going to happen because uh, some of the region already regions already banned 
them, but all of those churches continue to operate and the priests of Moscow Patriarchate refuse to leave those territories. So it's like still a, an open question. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, And today on Twitter, Claire Hubble.